Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, April 3rd, 2014. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, sour home brewer Gail Williams shares a couple of experiments. One, comparing how a hoppy 100% Brett beer ages versus the same beer pitched with Saccharomyces. And another experiment testing the effect of adding pasta to the fermenter of a sour beer. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is basicbrewing, all one word. Also, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. Our show page on Facebook is at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're on Google Plus, too. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us first and go to our website, click on our Amazon ad. It will take you back to Amazon where you can shop as you normally do. It won't cost you any extra, but you'll be benefiting this show. We greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site, too. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes and our Android app on Amazon.com. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app, and we're on the Windows phone directory, too. Check out our brewer's logbook at basicbrewingshop.com. In the front is a blank calendar that you can use to track your fermentations and plan your brews. So even if you buy one now, you will have 12 months of brewery planning in that calendar. And there's room in the back to log the details of up to 50 batches of beer. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. Thanks to everybody who has done so already. Protect your precious beer with one of our growler bags. It's going to warm up before too long. You'll need a growler bag to help insulate your growlers as you get them from those tasty, tasty uh, and talented craft brewers around your area. Check those out at basicbrewingshop.com as well. And finally, in the shameless plug department, uh, it looks like I'm about to run out of our new bottle openers. That's never happened before. I've never run, <laughs> never run out of something in the store. I have ordered some more. So if they are out of stock in the store, don't despair. They will be back, as will the offer of getting a free opener with the purchase of one of our DVD combos. Lots of people are taking advantage of that as well. So if you don't see the openers or the combos on the shop, we are waiting for the next shipment of bottle openers. So thanks to everybody who's snatched those up already. I'm running a little late today, and uh, Gail and I have a lot of tasty stuff to cover, so let's get to it. As you'll hear, Gail didn't waste any time in starting to brew sour beers once she got into home brewing, and she brews in small batches to allow her to experiment more easily. And I was very lucky to get to sample a couple of those experiments this week. Gail Williams, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you, James. You are uh, you are a rare bird here in this podcast. You are you are a brewer of the female persuasion. <laughs> well, you know that's changing, and I think it's changing super fast. And it's really interesting because uh, 2008 was when I sort of um, accidentally fell into home brewing. At the time that I first got into home brewing, which is about 2008, where I, where I accidentally got involved in the hobby through a weird series of uh, peculiar incidents um, involving things like going on vacation to Norway and realizing that I was missing IPA the whole time and thinking, <laughs> what's wrong with me? <laughs> um, you know, at some point I thought, okay, we're beer people. Uh, my husband, Steve, and I decided that we would put up the kind of a website that we wished that we had when we traveled for people who traveled to the San Francisco area. Uh, let's people use our regional transit system, which is called BART, and it's called Beer by BART. And we just put the site up to say there's places you can walk to from the stations. And at that point, we suddenly became deeply involved in the beer community. And it was it was an amazing transformation. We already knew, sort of knew some brewers and we, we knew the bartenders at some places, but now we knew all the people who owned the bars. Uh, we, we sort of became part of the family. And it was, uh, it was really um, gratifying in many ways that, that our sort of public service 
initiative had led to that. At that point, I figured I really needed to learn a lot more about beer, and I was really waiting for a chance. And one afternoon, Steve came back from City Beer Store in San Francisco and said, hey, I was down at City Beer, and I was talking to this woman down there who's about to take a class from somebody who's a nationally ranked or beer judge or something like that about beer styles. And I said, oh, my God, sign us up which we did, and we didn't know till we got to the first class meeting that it was really a pre-BJCP certification course. Huh. So we spent this entire class saying, um, well, you know, we're not going to take the test, but this is really awesome. We're really learning a lot. And then at the end, I took the test, and I judged for a little while, and I had that, ex- that thing of walking in where, you know, you're, there's like three women and 200 judges. <laughs> of the male persuasion in the room. And, um, you know, it was, it was interesting. I was thinking, this is really like the, when I first had a tech related job where you just feel like a, a pioneer and it's really strange to be back in that equation again. Um, but this split's cool. So for a little while I would, I would tell my fellow judges, um, I'm a beer judge. I'm uh, not a home brewer, but just a beer judge. And if you were, if we were wine judges, no one would be saying who here makes wine at home. I think judging is its own thing. So it was a great rant, and it went on for a month or so. And then I said, "Damn it, I have to start making beer." <laughs> <laughs> so I made two two total Saccharomyces batches, and then I said, "You know what? I think I'm only making sour beer because there's so much good commercial." wonderful craft beer in Northern California that I'm, that I can't, I don't have room for five gallons of a, of a homemade IPA, but, um, sour beer is always a little bit rare and special. In the years since then, I actually started making small batches. (laughs) I mean, breaking down my batches and making one gallon or, or two and a half gallon, uh, differentiated batches. So my sour beers have gotten rarer and more esoteric, but it's <laughs> been it's been an amazing experience, and I really enjoyed uh, listening to Basic Brewing because you've at least reinforced my idea of always splitting things. I'm not quite sure where I got the idea, but you know, I, it, from early on, I was thinking like, you know, I've got to learn. I've got to learn fast to catch up with these dudes, so I better <laughs> split my batches so I can learn something. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. It's a, it's a, it, it's an acceleration. That's another reason to do small batches. Yes, <laughs> yes, and and I see more women in the beer community all the time. I think it's going to change really fast. Well, I'm all for it. I mean, because the more people that brew, the more beer there is, and the and the faster, <laughs> you know, we all learn because. Uh, you know, we're all learning from each other in this process. So yes. <laughs> uh, so you sent me some experiments. Um, yes. And uh, let's start at the beginning. What, what what's the first one we're going to look at? Well, the first one, um, I was, I was, um, it was late, like late last uh, summer, going into fall, and I decided I wanted to make a session IPA, and then I figured. Okay, I ought to be able to prove that I can do a clean Saccharomyces beer in my kitchen. We're not <laughs> sure if this is true, but it's probably true. Uh, <laughs> and that was all good. And I wanted to do a, a little, a little beer, and you know, it seemed like a like a fun thing. And I figured, you know what, I ought to, um, I ought to split this and do half of it as 100% Brett fermentation. And, you know, if you've listened to people or you've tried any of the 100% Brett beers, they're much, they're, they're much cleaner mm-hmm. than uh, Lambic style mixed culture. With, and it generally won't have um, some of the horsey notes and, and um, other more colorfully described notes. Um, but, but they definitely will still taste like Brett. So the first beer, um, this is my, my little session beer, um, you got you got two labeled bottles, but it wouldn't be very hard to tell if they weren't labeled. And what what we're looking for here is uh, m- my reason to do this, besides wanting to try more things, was to figure out whether Britannomyces, which has a reputation of really scrubbing oxygen and helping preserve beers, would preserve the hop flavor and character better than um, a regular ale yeast would. Yeah, Chase Healy of uh, 
of pra- uh, Prairie Artisan Ales in Tulsa we visited with uh, last week <laughs> yes. said that his uh, his Funky Galaxy uh, beer, which has been around for a while, he cl- says that the the hoppiness seems to stick around uh, more because of the maybe the influence of Brett. And I think that this is one of those things that it's really great for home brewers at any level, beginning or advanced, to check these things out for ourselves. Mm-hmm. So speaking of checking things out, I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to open the uh, the 100% Saccharomyces first, and uh, you you said to open it with a note of caution. Are you are you worried? Are you should I be concerned, Gail? <laughs> well, we, you know, to make our big confession, we're taping this on April Fool's Day, and it's, <laughs> everything is sincere, except that there may be a big joke on myself, because um, I've been opening, you know, pairs of these beers for a little while now, for, you know, since September, or late, or early November, or early October, anyway, a while, <laughs> and uh, I have come across two bottles that were Saccharomyces that seemed to have picked up a little bit of bread. And mm. that's uh, pretty, I thought, okay, uh, my, I, I was very careful. I had brand new vinyl tubing. I had a, a new mini auto siphon that was my Saccharomyces only auto siphon. But my kitchen probably has a lot of bread living in it. And <laughs> so um, the, the character was different, but I can't promise you that uh that well we'll just have to see what okay. we got <laughs> okay here we drum roll please here we go <laughs> oh that was that was refreshingly uh, uh undramatic there <laughs> <laughs> whoops <laughs> so all that go. build up for nothing <laughs> well that's good though it's good to be cautious okay a quick quick sniff on that one for for I pour the second one yeah now, talk about the recipe Okay, well, this is a. Um, this was kind of interesting. I I was um, we, we were driving by and happened upon uh, a little uh, homebrew shop that I had never seen before. We we're on our way to drive up to Russian River, which is north of us, and um, stop for gas. And here's a homebrew shop, so we figured we should go say hi. Uh, I walked in, and then I figured we've been talking to these people. I ought to buy something. So this is a session IPA partial match kit. It was made with uh, four and a half pounds of Pilsner liquid malt extract, two pounds of two row, 75 one hundredths of a pound of wheat malt, six ounces of Crystal 30, three ounces of Kara wheat, and five ounces of Kara pills. Sorry, no metric on any of this because I didn't do my homework. <laughs> um, put in Horizon. At 60, 20, 10, and 0, and then um, Mosaic and Centennial um, added in for the dry hopping. Mm. And how long have these been in the bottle? This was, um, late September was my brew day. So um, I split the batch into two, and Saccharomyces yeast in half, and Britannomyces as a 100% primary yeast in the other half. And I would expect the Saccharomyces yeast to start to fade. The hops to start to fade. We'll start to get even some hints of cardboard mm. by now. I mean, this has been quite a long time for a small beer. Yeah, the, there is a there's a, a bit of difference in the carbonation. Uh, the Brett beer is a, is a bit more carbonated, um, but the the Saccharomyces beer is uh, very fruity. We're going to say maybe that's from the mosaic hops. Yeah, very tasty. Um, and but, this is the uh, Edinburgh ale, ale yeast from uh, White Labs, by the way. Okay. Mm. The Brett beer uh, it seems more bitter to me. I wish I wish that uh, I could do a blind tasting, but I'm <laughs> I'm here by myself. But but uh, but there is a difference in the in the hop character. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm getting any you know oxidative notes in the in the Saccharomyces beer, but it is it's certainly less interesting than the Brett beer. Um, and there is a there is a bit of funk in the in the Brett beer, but it's not 
you know, as overpowering as one might uh, expect if you'd never had a 100% Brett beer. Um, Michael Tonsmeyer sent us some 100% Brett beers a few years ago now, and we were amazed at how clean they were. Um, yeah. I, and I think that the Brexelensis uh, strain or rather, or, or mm. subspecies or whatever it is of Brett, uh, I think it actually will ferment a little bit cleaner. Is my, that's my current impression. But these mm. are experiments that you have to do for yourself. And the, the Brett C, which was originally isolated from, um, from British ales, um, this to me, it, you know, people, some people say tropical fruit, and I pretty much say leathery in some weird way like not mm -hmm. like um you know not quite like your new car leather smell and not quite like an old saddle but somewhere in the general leathery family and i definitely always get that from that yeast mm -hmm. it does taste a little yeah, funky is such a generic term uh but but there is that kind of a uh, little bit of funkiness there and leather is probably a pretty good descriptor but you're not getting like goaty, um, horsey. No, it's not. It's not barnyard. Um, it's not the kind of darker, uh, f funky notes that uh, that I associate with with some, uh, you know, funky <laughs> again funky beers. Right. Uh, these are kind of <laughs> these are bright bright notes, and they blend well with the hops. Um, the I would. I wouldn't think that uh, that the Brett beer is as old as it is. It tastes like a fresh, hoppy beer. So this is a fun thing to do, and it actually, you know, it's um, if you if you if you buy some Brett, mm. <laughs> which unfortunately doesn't come in powdered form yet, and I'm just waiting for that to happen. I think that will be like that will be a signifier that the brewing world has really changed when the dry <laughs> yeast people start making bread. But uh, yeah, you could need to order it and stick it in your fridge. And um, if you're, if you're making a small batch, you don't have to worry too much about the number of viable cells because uh, you know, the, the great thing about splitting a batch or starting with a small batch is um, you've got plenty of yeast to work with. And uh, I actually just, had this in my fridge for a couple of months in case I needed to do a bread experiment at some point. Um, but that's how my house is. <laughs> so, so you just pitched in uh, the the pitchable amount for five gallons into half that. I did. It was a little bit old, but I also wanted it to. So I, I wasn't sure it was all viable. Um, I know Chad Jacobson says that, that Brett doesn't actually really like cold temperatures all that much. So I thought, mm, I know it's been like three or four months in here. Um, on the other hand, you know, it's like, I thought, uh, if I'm over pitching Brett, um, you know, it's, I can't really see a huge downside for that. I mean, it, it, less of those, uh, the, some of the theories, which we should all probably be designing experiments for are that, uh, that, uh, Brett, puts out a lot of the, the really um, strange and interesting and mysterious flavors and aromas when it's under more stress. And I mm. thought, okay, less stress. We'll just go ahead. It's an easy, easy little beer to make. You know, go on, little Brett. Have fun. <laughs> and if you're, if you're concerned about uh, purchasing a pitchable amount, uh, you know, for a, for a larger batch, what would you think about using the dregs from that small batch – and using that into a, a larger batch. Oh, that's a really good idea. And I think my only question for myself would be whether I, um, being a really hoppy beer, what that would do. Hmm. But, um, you know, this, this Brett didn't seem to be too daunted by the hops, quite frankly. So, um, you know, it might add a little bitterness if you were putting into a beer that you didn't want, to, uh, you know, you were going to go in a sort of more traditional lambic direction. But, Hey, you know, the lambic brewers they 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 say they have like bitter lambic and sweet lambic when they're blending, so so be it. Well, did you see a difference in the performance of the two between the two strains as far as uh, vigor of fermentation or uh, attenuation after fermentation? Well, it, this is really interesting to me because the bread is you know, it can be super attenuative if it's in a, a mixed culture. But, you know, I had this sort of typical um, experience that when you do 100% bread in a sort of, in a, in a typical approximate amount that you would do with a, you know, ale or maybe lager fermentation, 
that um, it actually, you know, it stalls out around the same the same uh, point. And both of these came in at uh, ten ten. Hmm. So at in, th- in three weeks, I test I tested them. Gravity the same. So that was a real really surprising. And I was like, okay, it was a real easy word. It just chewed right through it. All right. Um, I did, you know, I'm, I'm suspect, I suspect that, uh, if I, you know, I'm holding a few bottles for like, a, you know, another six months or so. Um, another thing that I've noticed and other people have noticed that I'm keeping, keeping an eye on is that even though the Brett supposedly finishes out and, and acts like a normal yeast when it's all by itself, um, leave it in a bottle for a long time and there's still some viable cells and some of them will probably wake up and slowly chew away a little bit more and uh, you could get you could get more carbonation over time than you mm-hmm. expect. Well, that, that may explain the difference between the two. Um, Did you see like really fine bubbles in the Brett version? The, the, I, was, I was just looking the, in the Brett version uh, there is a head, a sustaining head inside the bottle. It's really crazy how <laughs> it's like, I don't know, it's like the bread and the hops together. They made this amazing, um, you know, moussey, as they say, which I think is like a, a, a beer descriptor artifact left over from hairdressing of the 80s or something. But, you know, moussey, like we're all supposed to think of what moussey is or, like. Or could it be chocolate mousse? Yeah, it could, but I'm suspicious <laughs> about the origins of uh, these descriptions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so b- big-haired people are writing uh, the style guidelines. Uh, <laughs> Gordon Strong is secretly a uh, big hair '80s I just, guy. I just think that was what every all. I think that's what all their girlfriends had kicking around in the you know at the time that they could compare it to. But you know. <laughs> I just imagine Gordon Strong in a in a hair band. You know, yeah, they're on the disco floor. <laughs> you don't know what, and you know we don't ask about anyone's past. <laughs> <laughs> so those were cool. Um, I I definitely uh I definitely enjoyed the the Brett beer uh better. Did you in the beginning uh did you see that big of a difference between the two as far as the hop character? The hop character came through better in the Saccharomyces beer at the beginning because it didn't have a, a, another flavor in there. The the Edinburgh ale yeast is quite neutral compared to something like Britannomyces. So, um, I, and I actually kind of like the Brett beer better all along, but that's just because I, I like really like Brett, but <laughs> uh, can't help it. Um, but I think the hop character and the, and the mosaic character really, um, it really was shining in the simpler beer at the beginning. Hmm. Um, the- so there, there's no reason not to make both and finish the, <laughs> finish the one that's not going to keep earlier. <laughs> Interesting. Um, let me make sure that I pour the the equal volumes between the two. Uh, it may be that the Saccharomyces beer is a little bit darker. That's interesting. Now, that could be an oxidation thing. Yeah. I mean, that's really the only difference that, that, that I would expect to be going on here is that the Brett is continuing to scrub oxygen in a way that Saccharomyces won't be doing. But that... No, that's just my expectation. So the uh, <laughs> the Brett beer is a little bit more cloudy, I think, because it, I think it shipped upside down because there's <laughs> there's a little oh. bit of there's a little bit of sediment in the neck of the bottle. But it may so may that may just be some yeast and suspension that's given it you know kind of a lighter color. But it, it seems like to me that there's maybe half a shade darker from the Saccharomyces beer. Yeah, I think that that's that sounds about right. I don't have them in front of me at the moment, but that sounds mm. completely plausible. Oh, that's a tasty beer. Boy, that's really nice. Uh, that's the Brett beer. <laughs> Very nice. Um, well, thank you. I feel selfish that I'm here by myself. <laughs> yeah, you know, but I'll get over it. You know, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, so it goes. You know, maybe a little more goes in the dump bucket, but it's all good. <laughs> well, supper is after this, so <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Um, all right, now, now let's move on to the next uh, next thing on the list, and this is using an ingredient that I don't think that I have experienced in a beer before. Talk about this one. Hmm. 
well, should I say it right off the top? Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is uh, this is spaghetti beer. Uh, <laughs> so my <laughs> when I first decided I have to make sour beers, and I was pretty inexperienced. It was going to be my third batch. And I looked around and I found this really nice presentation by Steve Piatz. And you can also find a, a BYO magazine article online uh, about the same thing. And, it, and it's, a, it's a really wonderful, encouraging article about just using dry malt extract and um, making just going for it with your first sour beer. And don't worry about the different ways that, uh, that, that the Lambic brewers did their turbid mash, et cetera, et cetera. So when I read that... Um, I noticed there's a line in it that said uh, we're we're going to use uh, malted wheat DME wheat dry malt extract instead of uh, of a um, unmalted wheat, which is what would be authentic, because there's not a good uh, there's not an extract version of unmalted wheat. And so I was immediately going, well, let's see what would be good. Um, I flour would probably get all lumpy and clumpy and uh, you wouldn't want to put that into your extract boil, but wait a minute. What if you used pasta? But I didn't. I didn't do it right then. I, you know, I, I let it be, and I let. I went around and did several other batches of of sour beer. And at some point, I thought, you know, I want to keep this easy and keep it, uh, you know, urban kitchen compatible. But I want to. Um, I want those starches in there. Because I think it's different. I think maltodextrin is rather complex. You can put some of white maltodextrin powder in. It's a big sugar. But it's not the same as uh, the raw starches. And so I, the, first thing, the first time I, I did one of these beers, I put uh, uh, boiled wild rice in because it was all exotic and interesting. And, of course, I ended up with a sour beer. I couldn't taste the boiled wild rice in any way. And I didn't know what it did. Uh, so I, I started at some point. I started using pasta. It's it's nice. It's uh, um, you can get beautiful um, heirloom variety whole wheat, uh, you know, organic pasta grown in the mountains of Italy or whatever. You know, you can find amazing kinds of pasta, and uh, they they aren't going to clump. And then I thought, you know, I don't really want them in the boil. And by that time, I had made a bunch of, of fruit sours where you end up with the uh, you put you put the the Britannomyces in with fruit, and it, you end up with these like ghost fruits, like they're like a like like the ash of a blueberry sitting in there. There's there's nothing left. It's been eaten through. And I thought, well, I'm just going to put the pasta in the fermenter. And I was thinking about this, and then I happened to have this great great experience. Of, I went to Belgium and walked in to Cantillon on a brew day that was unscheduled brew day. And uh, I had met Jean Van Roy before, and so, or Jean Van Roy before, and um, Ex- Excuse said, me, Gail, you, you've dropped something. Oh, it's a name. Oh, sorry. It's a name. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So anyway, the brewer at Cantillon. Um, <laughs> I met him before, and I was really surprised that uh, he, he remembered us. And uh, immediately when we got there, he said, Oh, you have to taste my wort. And I'm like, okay. And I've, you know, <laughs> had a lot of I've had a lot of sweet substances and, you know, sort of syrupy stuff and then that would be fun. It was unbelievable to me. It was like cream of wheat. There was so much starch. Hmm. And I was so shocked by that. And so then I'm like, okay, I'm definitely I'm definitely got to keep working on the spaghetti thing. So um, what we, where we're at now in this process is I'm trying to really sort of get the amounts down. And my thought last spring was I'm going to do a split batch and I'm going to make one of them and I'm going to, using uh, fortified with some um, uh, maltodextrin that I got from the homebrew shop. It's long chain sugar. And I'm going to make another one that's extract that I'm going to put on spaghetti and split the batch and then see whether there are any sensory differences. So, so this is a one year old lambic. So I've got I've got a couple of questions. Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't you just use unmalted wheat? And and two, how did you prepare the spaghetti? 
<laughs> oh, this is really good. Okay. So um, I've used unmalted wheat when I was doing an all grain version, although I didn't do a whole side turbid mash, which you can read a lot about. But, I, but I've used, I've done that. Um, but, but the thing I was really fascinated in, um, this original Steve Piott's recipe for keeping it super simple I really wanted to have the easiest possible extract version of a lambic. And it became sort of, you know, it sort of was like a challenge. Um, so so it's, I, I was like, I was wanting to keep this all um, super simple ingredients. And since I'd already made a couple sour beers on fruit and I realized how much time, you know, having months of time for things to um, dissolve and then be soaked in alcohol and acid and then eaten, you know, by, by our little friends, um, I realized that there's no reason to cook the spaghetti. That's just an, an annoying extra step. Hmm. So I, um, and, and it, you got to remember here, I'm making, this is a mixed culture beer. This is not a pure culture Brett beer like the last one. This is a, a sort of something in the Lambic tradition. If um, If you follow some of the early, American homebrewers versions of this, they would, uh, you know, you leave it, leave the fermenter open in the kitchen the first night to get your, get your kitchen bugs in there. And then you pitch stuff and there's all kinds of variations. And I thought, um, all right, there might be a little bit of bacteria on the spaghetti, but, uh, you know, or, or whatever pasta I decide, I'm not sure shape matters here, but, uh, um, you know, there, there could be, but that's probably similar to introducing, you know, uh, some minor things that are going to go away when the alcohol and the, and the acidity go up. So I put raw pasta hmm. into a um, half-sized um, better bottle, and then the other one, I just put in um, the maltodextrin powder, I don't. I can't tell you that I have a really good logical reason for, for uh, the amounts that I put in. I, I kind of got carried away and put the whole package of pasta in after talking myself through having it be less than the package. Um, <laughs> so my science is a little weak on this, but I'm still really just interested in what what the flavor contribution should be and whether this is, um, as I believe it is, worth worth the trouble. So the, while I pour. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to open the uh, the non pasta one first. <laughs> yeah. Um, so <laughs> you would think. I mean, would there be any advantage to? I mean, when you when you when you think of putting such things into a mash, you you might think of boiling it to gelatinize the starches or something like that. Is I mean, uh, you follow my my yes. kind of uh, thinking there. I do, and that's why I went for pasta, because I was thinking, what is a good, clean uh, ingredient that can come in anywhere from um, cheap at the, at the local grocery store to exotic and organic, et cetera, uh, that is pre-gelatinized and 100% wheat? Well, that's what I've got. It's, uh, they already did all that for us in making the pasta. Okay, I'm... I'm I'm smelling. Do, do you see? Um, did you pour them both out? Yes. Do you see any differences in color and? Uh... Um, boy, they're close. Color wise, mm. they're very. To me, they're close. Okay. It looks like to me maybe. Maybe the. On this sample, maybe the pasta is a little. Maybe. Boy, they're close. It looks like to me maybe the pasta one, maybe just because of the way I, I poured, but it looks a little more clear, just a, a little bit more le or less cloudy than, than the non-pasta. Uh, yeah, I think UPS shipped my beers upside down. <laughs> <laughs> what, did you, what did you expect? I mean, what, did you, what have you – no, what did <laughs> – that came out wrong. What did, yeah. what did you anticipate uh, – me seeing or what have you seen in the past um i expected the whole wheat to be a little bit darker because i used whole wheat spaghetti and 
there's um, there's a little bit of wheat husk material, and no, it's not really husk, but the wheat bran material that's in there too. But yeah, it's really subtle. This, I mean, this is a subtle thing. <laughs> this is not like a you know, oh my god, comparison. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my god, boy, those are good. Um, thank you. Wow, those are. <laughs> Those are really good beers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you like them. Oh man! So what the the um, you got the uh, it's a bug farm mixed culture. Yeah, this is a this is a company called East Coast Yeast that does um, frustratingly small batches yeah. so that you yeah. have to sign up and wait for them. But uh, uh, really, really lovely blends, and this is one of the bug farm cultures. Which is a, a blend. Mm. Oh my goodness! Uh, very, very tart, but uh, tart on the back end, but kind of free, uh, uh, kind of a sweet on the front end. If if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I sort of thought a little lemony, but it isn't quite. It isn't necessarily quite like any known fruit you know i think like yeah it's fruity and you're supposed to then afterwards say what kind of fruit and i kind of go i don't know fruit from other another planet or something it's it's just fruit i i i wish i again i wish i'd i'd done this blind but is there a is there a tiny bit of a dark flavor after note at the uh, on the pasta one to you I to me I get more complexity. I mean, ne- neither of them is horsey. Um, I think there's a little bit more aroma on the pasta one, and I uh, I think, but uh, and I think it reminds me a little bit more of um, a Belgian goose. But it might be mm-hmm. I might I might be suggestible on that course because that's what I was trying for. Um, there is a phenolic note that one of them might have and the other not. A friend of mine uh, calls this um, burnt circuit board because he's done too much high tech. Mm. Um, and to me is a little bit like, um, you know, hot tires. And you get this a little bit in Lambic sometimes. I get a little of that. That that, you know. that I get in a little, just a teeny bit, kind of the, the burnt. Um, if you've ever set a model airplane on fire. <laughs> 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 well, there you go. That's the equivalent of uh, of a circuit board, right? And, that, yeah. and, that, and that's on the non. On the non, okay. So. That's interesting. Okay. But that again, we can blame UPS. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make that a tougher com- comparison. Does one mm. of them seem to have like, like a sort of a sugary note in the aroma? I I, I wrote down that. Uh, um, Sort of like old old fashioned um like like peach nectar and from a can I used to have that when I was a kid. It's like a little bit of a a sweet aroma I'm gonna have to come back with these I think they're still they're still pretty cold <laughs> yeah that's well, it's a hard thing and it's hard to it's really hard to taste uh remotely <laughs> wow. it's it's a great skill to cultivate and i uh I appreciate all the the sessions that i've They've heard you guys do at Basic Brewing where you, you try and walk through flavors because it's a hard thing to describe flavors. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's hard to connect those things in your brain. Yeah. But, man, they're both just complex and tart and uh, really wonderful. Uh, Thank just, you. Yeah. They're just um, – and I don't know that – I mean, maybe as they warm up, maybe there will be a, a a big difference between the two. Um but I think it's um, subtle. <laughs> yeah. Do, well, what is it? Does the do the do the bugs eat the uh, eat the pasta? What does the fermenter look like at the end? Yeah, you know, and I've I've done this with a couple of different different beers. This is this is a year old beer, um, and so it sort of it still looked like pasta at the bottom of the fermenter. Uh, I've done some that I left for more than a year, and the the pasta was broken down to where it kind of into beads where it looked almost like grains of rice they were still um just sort of falling apart and mm. so there's certainly some some things that can't be digested there but a, a lot that can and i i actually wrote um steve piazza and you know when i did this i thought you know hey i should tell him that this this inspired it and 
he said, well, it seems plausible that the bacteria would be able to break down the starch. So one of the things I want to do in the future is um, try putting some 100% um, Brett beer on uh, on pasta <laughs> and see and see whether the bread itself can break the, the starches down or whether this is, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the lactobacillus and pediococcus and so forth that, that would be in the mix. I'm getting maybe maybe a, just a teeny bit more kind of the the darker funky notes from the pasta beer, but I thought I thought so. I thought it it, it had more complexity. Um, neither of those is a really horsey barnyardy beer at all. But mm. I thought I thought there was more complexity from the wheat. I I, I preferred it, but it is subtle and. So my, in the future, I'm going to probably do a split batch that's, that's about dosage. <laughs> <laughs> What's the right spaghetti dosage? <laughs> and triangle tests. That's, oh, yeah. You know, that's where you can do two of one and, and one of the other and do t- tastings and see if you're fooling yourself. Uh, <laughs> it's, always, it's always good to, to take, your, take your own brain out of the equation. Um, yeah. But, uh, man, both of those are very nice. Well, thank you. And so the the last. Well, you... the last I I kind of threw this in. Um, I didn't know whether you wanted to taste it on the show or taste it ahead of time as an audition beer to figure out if I could make beer or what. <laughs> <laughs> what you might want to do. Um, it's just one I really like. Um, it's uh um. I, this one has a real name. Um, it's Dawn Voyage, which was going to be Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And then I thought, I can't do a C.S. Lewis name from my homebrew. So it's called <laughs> Dawn Voyage. <laughs> and it's just a, it's an earlier blended sour, including a little bit of backyard ambient. Um, you know, that I, where I, I tried my little um, open fermenter on the back porch project. Um, ended up blending it all out, which should tell you something right away. But it is it did add some nice complexity to later beers. And on this one I put uh I put it all on two varieties of dried apricots. Mm. And uh uh was pretty happy with it. Oh my. The <clears throat> the aroma is um kind of perfumey. And and uh ap- you can you can smell the fruit. I'm betting I could I could have picked that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I should have said uh, perhaps stone fruit. See what you get. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, woo! <laughs> sour. <laughs> wow. Oh, but it, but the first sip, you got the sweetness of the fruit. And that's what that's where the different noises came from. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the first impact was the there was the sweetness of the fruit, and then it switched over to sourness. You know, as it as it uh, as it went down. Boy, that's a fun that's a fun beer as well. I like this one, and this is this is for my. Um, and mm. I when I first I made a few sour beers that turned out too sour and I started backing off and then I realized you know what I kind of I kind of like one that's going to be like like the sour the most sour candy you ever had as a child mm. that just really goes whoa wakes you right up well it's those what are this is it sour patch kids or whatever that that they're that they're <laughs> sour and then they're sweet this is kind of like the opposite <laughs> yeah but definitely this is sour <laughs> <laughs> but give it give us some details if people want to brew something like this at home uh so that it's just not a show about me drinking good beers okay so what as i started making these beers and realizing the power of split batches especially if you uh, don't have a lot of space or if all your other space is devoted to your other beers, um, you might want to have a lot of small containers with different sour beers in them that you can blend together. And so uh, as well as deciding to add pasta to some and um, trying some other experiments, you know, that, that are that were a little outside of the out of the box. Um, I often would do something like just have a high gravity and low gravity split. Um, you know, there's dilute dilute part of the of the uh, batch and put that in one and undiluted in the other, and then pitch the same 
lambic mixture or whatever you're using, and they will be different in six months. Hmm. Um, the other thing, this seems to kind of be like sour spring on basic brewing. Yeah. <laughs> You've had like a lot of uh, related stuff lately. And uh, we, if we go back to the, the um, goose blending um, uh, program, um, this, you know, the, a really key thing is, is to have some different flavors to play with. Um, some, some of the people who blend, um, you know, really suggest that you get kind of a neutral beer and uh, put some of that in a glass and then add small parts of the funkier beers and you know to be um i, I think uh the, the my favorite quote about this is is lauren salazar from new belgium says it's like adding petals to the daisy oh. so it's and so if you have a lot of funky beers sitting around you can smell them and taste them and say okay what uh, you know what are the petals i've got to add to this daisy and and it's really kind of a nice way to to think about it and look at it. Uh, I had a a backyard um, or or back porch beer. Um, it was really odd. There was there evidently um, you know, after, after a year in in it. This was a plastic tub beer. Um, I left it out overnight with. Uh, First of all, I had like one of those those big net sort of brew in a bag bags over the top of it, and then I put um, some wooden folding uh, furniture <laughs> chair on top of it so the raccoons that go by wouldn't get into it. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> even though it's San Francisco, we got our wildlife. Um, and so the next morning, I was all excited and thinking about the, the deep mystic history of these amazing beers, and um, put it away for six months or so and tasted it, and it's like. Well, this is interesting. It definitely had alcohol, wasn't sour. That was sort of a shock and no trace of bread and really odd notes like a, a sort of um, tasted like a uh, pear um, lifesavers meets some kind of like mint, only not or, I mean, sort of minty. And it wasn't a hop mint. So I was I was like, this is totally weird. Um I'm going to trust that it's out, you know, it's, it definitely looks, it, it, it attenuated, it's, um, it's something alcoholic, but it's not what I expected. So I first I thought, okay, I'm going to bottle this, and several people tasted it, and they all thought, wow, that's so weird that this is what, what the local flora and fauna tastes like, and the, this is our microbiota, and at some point I thought, you know what, it's not really delicious. Mm. But I figured, okay, what if I use this as a blending element, which I did. Um, and so there's a little bit of that in this beer, and it's it's pretty submerged because there's fruit in it. Um, so I made I blended my sours, and I then prepared a plastic bucket because it's my favorite thing for for fruit. And I put a lot of chopped dried apricots, two varieties, in the bottom, and and transfer gently transferred this uh, this blend that you know rack, racked over my blend. And usually it's about three months on dried fruit is is plenty of time. I I got interested in dried fruit um, partly because uh, that's what's that's the Russian River method, and mm. I and those are my you know sort of our home base long time sour beers, and uh, the great and also because. When I was doing these uh, the wild beer experiments, I get all really interested in making sour beers and then blending beers so I could empty some carboys in the winter time, because you need cold air to get the supposedly get the right organisms in the air, hmm. um, and so in the winter time you can't get the kind of summer fruit flavors unless you use dried fruit. In my opinion, I, th I think it's I think they have a much more spectacular flavor than canned fruit does, for example. Mm -hmm. You're talking about uh, doing the, the porch fermentation. Mm -hmm. I, st I still have my Erlenmeyer flask of my starter that I made with my fig from my fig tree Ooh. in the fall or, or the end of the growing season. And I still haven't done anything with it. It's just still sitting there, um, mainly because I'm kind of afraid of it. But does it smell good? Um, well, let me smell it. Let's do an update Ooh. here on the. Uh, <laughs> oh, great! It smells a little. It doesn't smell bad. Okay, but doesn't smell like nail polish. You're already way ahead of the game. This is good. It smells a teeny bit cheesy. 
Hmm. But it did. It, it did smell. Um, uh, it, it the smell has changed over time. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess what I need to do is just 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 buckle down and 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 put a little um, pipette down in there and and get a sample and just taste it and just see what it tastes like. Um, well- is think, is there is there a reason to be afraid of this stuff that we just start with spontaneous quote unquote spontaneous fermentations? Yeah, I think there is, and 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 I um you know I, actually this is I think something I picked up perhaps from your Facebook page a while ago. There was an article about people who make a, a pruno or whatever they want to call it in prison out of oh, yeah. different food scraps and fruit. And this causes death in prisons, and, and 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 so why would that be? Well, basically, when you're when you're doing uncontrolled fermentation, you are basically starting with food poisoning, going ahead with spoilage, and and you're relying on the combination of either or you know either or acidity or alcohol killing all that bad stuff. Mm. So that it's then safe to drink. So if you don't let it go long enough, or if it doesn't, for some reason, it doesn't ferment, it could have some bad stuff in it. So I think that, you know, you need to smell it. And it's really nice idea to take some gravity because, um, you know, when, when it changes to alcohol, of course, it just plummets. And, you, you know, that's a good way to tell. And then taste it. And um, that, I think that's all you have to do. And I, the main thing to do is to not have it right away. And people say, wow, you know, I'm, I did a backyard ambient batch and I tasted it two days later. And I'm thinking, why? I said, nothing <laughs> had happened yet. I was like, yeah, you're just growing a lot of stuff in there that you're, that you're trusting that the alcohol and the acidity is going to kill off. Because mm. we don't really want to drink a lot of E. coli, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've it had might, my time with that. <laughs> yeah, it might, it might give us some nice – and I actually supposedly – those things actually do contribute flavor, but mm. they're inert by the time we want to drink it. So maybe if you live on a, 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 a cattle farm, you may not <laughs> you may not want to do the the ambient well, uh, fermentation. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think it's fine. You just have to make sure that it that it actually gets fermenting, and you know you can you can usually tell. I mean, we've all made beer. We we know what this does. So yeah, um, I think I think you. If if you tasted it and it was sickly sweet, hmm. I would spit it out. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't expect that that would happen because you know every, everything likes to eat sugar. So well, and and there was quite a bit of activity in the in the flask on the yeah. stir plate. Uh, there was lots of bubbles and uh, you know lots of uh, you know. In fact, there was a couple of waves of of different uh, uh, activity. So, you know, I'm, right. I'm thinking that there may be a couple of populations of things in there that, that had their way with the uh, sugars. Um, so, I know I'm just a big chicken. No, but, but that's a, this is what this is the good thing is that, that people, you know, people lived on fermented substances, you know, for how many? We don't even know how many thousands of years. This has kept, this has kept our species alive in the face of water that wasn't safe to drink because, you know, generally it wants to ferment we can observe it and know it's fermented, and then it's actually much safer. There you go. Well, Gail, this has been a ton of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it has been fun, really fun. Well, good. I I hope you'll keep us updated on any more uh, fun things that you want to put in your fermenters. And, uh, you know, if if it's not for you putting pasta in your beer, who else is going to do it? <laughs> Well, that's why, you know, we, we all trust that there's going to be lots of homebrewers out there thinking outside the box, and that's what helps move the beer world forward. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, Gail. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thanks again to Gail. Those were some really fun and tasty experiments. Hope that was inspirational uh, to you. Lots of great info. Uh, if you are in the uh, San Francisco area or are planning to visit there, you may want to check out Gail's site, beerbybart.com. I would love to live in a place where public transportation and great beer were paired up so nicely. So that's very cool. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. You'll find our new bottle openers in our shop. Or I hope you will. We may run out, <laughs> but they'll be back. So if you don't see them on the shop, they will be back. 
Uh, our basic brewing growler bags are available. Protect your precious homebrew and craft beers. You take it from place to place. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. Along with our combo deals, if we have the openers, uh, <laughs> also look for our shirts as well. Our brewer's logbooks are in the store, too. Keep track of up to 50 batches of beer. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are 9-inch anti-splash funnel with strainer and Orbit Ultralight 10-pattern turret pistol hose spray nozzle. Thanks again, everybody. Remember... I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We'd greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com as well. That's all until next time. Till then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dutz. And Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. Thank you.